Today I'll do uh, my second time rounds of the year. I had a chance to dust off this uh, suit for a second time. Um, <clears throat> just on uh, ketamine and fentanyl, uh, focus on uh, ketamine cystitis and then talk briefly at the end just about fentanyl and what it's doing to uh, our community and uh, our other community. Um, I'll put this picture up in the background just to see if anybody could get it. Miles pick it out right off the bat. It's Dr. Goldenberg might know where it is. <laughs> it's uh, Indio, California. I put this up because there's two major events that happen in and around uh, the Western North America every year. That probably leads to an increase in ketamine uh, consumption. One of it's Coachella, which is in Palm Springs, and Burning Man in uh, August of this year. And I wanted to actually get an idea to see if the staff will have an increase in the amount of consults from young men and women having lower urinary tract dysfunction uh, after, about six months after these uh, events. Um, <clears throat> anyways, the, uh, today's objectives I'll go over today, um, just examine the history, uh, basic pharmacology, methods of use, and uh, abuse of ketamine first. And then um, we'll talk about uh, what the pathological implications are of uh, ketamine exposure in the acute and chronic setting. And then um, with respect to working up and developing kind of treatment plans for these patients, even though they may be a rarity in the clinic, it certainly uh, potential for an increasing uh, exposure to these patients. And then just in the last uh, five, ten minutes, we'll just uh, talk about uh, fentanyl and um, what potentially the implications are for uh, these patients awaiting transplant. Does anybody know who this is? It's uh, John C. Lilly. He's like a, uh, he's a, uh, a neuro uh, uh, analyst who is an MD, kind of uh, a pretty substantial academic history, like physicist from Caltech. Um, medicine at UPN, UPenn and Dartmouth and he, he's actually the one who kind of popularized usage of ketamine in his self and um, he called it in the 70s kind of after the uh, or in and around the psychedelic era he called it uh, his usage of ketamine a peeping tom at the keyhole of eternity which is a little bit drastic I don't know <laughs> I don't know if that's the case um, <clears throat> With respect to uh, the original discovery and uh, synthesis of ketamine, it's actually um, synthesized by um, this gentleman named Calvin Stevens, and this was in 1962. And um, this uh, individual was a pharmacist at uh, Wayne State University and worked as a consultant for Park Davis Laboratories. And what they were trying to do at the time was to find a, uh, a derivative of PCP with less stimulation and a shorter duration of action. And they came up through the Grignard reaction uh, with this thing called CI581, which was the uh, precursor of ketamine. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Domino, seen here on the far right, uh, was a clinical pharmacologist who, uh, with a series of anesthesiologists, actually took this um, derivative and uh, used it in the Park Davis Clinical Research Unit. Um, which is located at the prison in, uh, in uh, Detroit. And uh, they used it on 20 volunteers in the prison and found it uh, in increasing doses to provide these kind of out-of-body experiences. The molecule itself is a combination of an R and an S enantiomer. And it's, that's a little bit different, actually, because they both have effects, differing effects on the central nervous system and uh, body physiology. And most drugs that are, are synthesized, only the, um, uh, the S will usually have an effect on uh, uh, physiology. But R, in this case, in ketamine's case, uh, has an effect. Um, the evolving uses of ketamine really, uh, after these experiments in 1964, they started to increase in the use and uh, through a series of studies, uh, ketamine appro was approved by the FDA for general anesthetic use. And it's classified as a, what's called a dissociative anesthetic and it really means it has anxiolytic um, and hypnotic effects and then this a side effect of uh, analgesia, and this is really from like an out-of-body experience that patients get from it, and they have a loss of limb sensation. So they basically don't, they're completely detached from their bodies and don't recognize the pain that's happening within their body, or the, effectively the pain that's happening within their bodies. Um, <clears throat> it was initially used uh, pretty heavily in the 70s as an anesthetic, but um, because of the dosages, uh, because of the increasing dosages that they were using, they were noticing a lot of patients were having this thing called an emergence reaction, which is, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So it, it scaled back a little bit, but 
uh, they did give it to uh, battlefield medics, and it started to, to be used pretty substantially in the first in um, the Vietnam War, and it's still used actually as uh, the anesthetic of choice for tactical combat care. Um, used heavily in the burns and critical care medicine populations, and um, uh, quite readily in the pediatric population. I think they put it in the bubbles that we blow at the uh, kids in the <laughs> at BCCH. Um, <clears throat> of course, the problem with this experience is uh, uh, associated with its devolving uses. And uh, this really has uh, actually um, arisen in the early 90s associated with like electronic dance music and um, the rave counterculture. And they started to be used by people attending these raves. And they estimate that over 2.3 million people uh, over 12 years old in the U.S. have abused ketamine, meaning used it more than once. And uh, over the last year, uh, 200,000 people have been using ketamine, which is pretty substantial if you think about it. Uh, one to two percent of high school students admit to using it, and it's either in, it's even more prevalent in, a, in its abuse in uh, Asian countries and through Asian cultures, actually. Um, <clears throat> WHO produces this really nice uh, graph, or a really nice um, paper every year. Um, it's like the drug and abuse and uh, narcotics trafficking papers uh, that comes out every year. And they take a survey worldwide of uh, all of these countries. And you can see that just here on the top left is drugs purchased on the dark net, um, which means that you can actually purchase ketamine on the internet. Like it will ship to your house, no problem. Um, and like I say earlier, the tends to typically be associated um, in Asian cultures as the primary drug of choice for people who are abusing drugs on a regular basis. So um, in Hong Kong, for example, 40% of drug users are saying that ketamine is their primary drug of choice. Um, usage data is kind of taken from the seizure data worldwide, and these are uh, police seizures uh, that have been steadily increasing. You see in 2010, actually, Canada had a huge uh, seizure of like two tons of ketamine. Not sure where that was, though. Hopefully not. Here. Toronto, yeah. Uh, the <coughs> ketamine itself, as a drug, can be um, administered through a variety of different routes. Uh, medicinally, uh, anesthesiology gives it IM, IV, and PO. Uh, recreationally, most of the users are using it in like an inhaled or snorted powder form, and that gives a typical onset uh, time course, about 45 to 60 minutes of this dissociative high. You can get longer time frames if you use like an intranasal spray, so they're actually putting it um, uh, a combination of ketamine and corticosteroids and intranasal sprays. And then IV injection of ketamine is a very, very rapid onset, but um, only lasts for about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, there is a high rate of dependence uh, noted in this community, actually, with uh, approximately 17% of users of the drug are noticing dependence. And these <clears throat> dependence is associated with just uh, hitting a second high during that, um, or more, uh, during that usage phase. But the um, symptoms associated with detoxing off of it are not necessarily as severe as something like heroin, but um, certainly lots of sweating, lacrimation, um, they have gastrointestinal problems, can be a lot of vomiting. Um, so this is, tends to typically have people go and uh, reuse, especially with IV injections. With respect to its uh, pharmacokinetics and metabolism, uh, the drug itself is uh, Interesting that it's almost immediately bioavailable um, when injected IV. Like you can, it's a fast-inducing um, anesthetic and uh, hypnotic. Uh, typically, within the first minute, can have its maximum effects. I mean, its half-life typically lasts for 10 to 15 minutes, but the it can have a cumulative building effect as the metabolic byproducts also have um, psychotropic effects. It's metabolized through the liver. Primary metabolite is norketamine, um, which is about 20 to 30 percent as active as ketamine itself. And this tends to typically build up and up and up. And that has toxic effects uh, either throughout the body or, as we'll talk about, in the urine. 
where 99% of the metabolic products of hemp are actually excreted through. Very limited uh, amount comes out through the stool. This is a comic on the uh, right <laughs> showing uh, ketamine itself knocking out a bladder, which we'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> Some of the really interesting effects of ketamine actually in the central nervous system. I uh, had uh, an opportunity to kind of nerd out a little bit during this uh, presentation and get back to my neuroscience roots, but um, ketamine itself has uh, this unique property. It freely uh, diffuses through the blood-brain barrier because it has water and lipid solubility. And what it does at various places throughout the nervous system is it binds non-competitively to a site on the NMDA receptor uh, that usually binds PCP, which is weird, it's angel dust. Um, NMDA receptor is a physiological receptor in the brain, has a site that binds these psychotropic medications. The NMDA receptor itself is kind of a, a, it's a very unique receptor within the central nervous system. It's actually uh, thought of as somewhat of a gating system to induce long-term potentiation, which is the underlying pinnings of um, synaptic plasticity or memory formation. And through gating of NMDA channels, you can build and retract the strength of neural networks. That's one thing. It does a variety of other things. And I don't think the true, uh, full physiologic um, uh, characteristics of NMDA receptors have truly been established yet. But the thought is with ketamine is that it will bind and dampen this NMDA uh, receptor activation through noci ascending nociceptive stimulation, and that decreases both uh, limb pain and limbs in space, depending on where it is in the brain. <clears throat> in addition, ketamine can also bind glutamate, opioid, muscarinic, nicotinic receptors, and in a landmark paper in science in 2012, it's actually shown to increase synaptogenesis, which is shown in the uh, top right there, um, with those little buds on the bottom picture in mice that have been stressed out through exposure to box urine. <laughs> That's how you stress mice out, mice out in the lab. And um, they tend to typically decrease the formation of, synaptic, of synapses uh, through the stress response. But ketamine introduced after will increase the formation of it, so it actually decreases their response to, their negative response to the stress effect. And it's being used in uh, the psychiatric world as a IV injection for non-treatment response of major depressive disorder now too. Um, <clears throat> with respect to its adverse physiological effects, neurologically, high doses can give you hallucinations, amnesia, mental fog, all of these uh, complications associated with the central nervous system. Cardiovascular and respiratory wise, you can get tachycardia, hypertension, bronchodilation. That can be used in a positive way if it's under controlled situations. Gastrointestinally, you can get nausea, musculoskeletal, dystonia, something called pseudoparesis, where people are able to move their limbs but just won't. They just can't. Um, and of course, these emergent reactions, which back in the 70s, as I mentioned earlier, in the anesthetic world, they <clears throat> stopped using it as much because patients were having these incredibly vivid dreams, extracorporeal sensations and illusions, and this happened in approximately 10 to 30 percent of patients in the immediate post-op period. With some tweaking of how the of how ketamine was actually administered pre, intra, and post-op, it started to become a little bit more of a um, a useful anesthetic as an adjunct or even the primary. Now, within the last decade. Um, <clears throat> with respect to urology surgeries, for example, ketamine induction or uh, ketamine um, uh, perfusion throughout a TERP after a spinal anesthetic is given can really decrease intraoperative hypotension. And some recent experiences with uh, a group out of Wisconsin has actually shown that. Uh, ketamine predominant anesthesia can actually decrease the amount of postoperative ileus in patients undergoing robotic assisted radical cystectomy. 
So uh, Jacobson's group here looked at 40 age and disease match patients for bladder cancer that, was un that were undergoing uh, robot-assisted radical cystectomy with extended pelvic lymphnode dissection. They did an extracorporeal urinary diversion, and 25 uh, of these patients got an opioid-predominant uh, protocol uh, administered through anesthesia pre-intra and post-operatively. And then 15 of these patients actually took a different approach. They did a preoperative ketamine infusion, intraoperatively continued that infusion with adjuncts, and then postoperatively were given a ketamine infusion in the recovery room and then transitioned to oral ketamine on the unit. And they looked at um, <clears throat> median days until bowel movement and median days until discharge. And it was substantially decreased in the non-opioid predominant or ketamine-based anesthesia. So three days, there were, uh, these patients were getting bowel movements. And in the, as compared to six days in the opioid predominant uh, group. And median days until discharge, four days. I mean, uh, I don't think we've ever <laughs> sent a patient home on day four from a cystectomy attempt. Um, but, that's compared to the eight days that uh, the opioid predominant group would, uh, uh, would undergo. Something to think about. I don't know if uh, our anesthesiologists are uh, super keen on doing that, moving away. None of these patients had epidurals, by the way. It was just either opioids or ketamine. Did they, were they synchronously evaluated, 15 No, uh, so it was the, so 40 patients, single <coughs> surgeon, um, and they did 15 patients successively, and then 25 patients, so they probably interspersed a randomized trial, or a randomized agent between. Okay, so it was randomized? Yeah. Was it just oh, these, yeah, all of these guys were randomized. Twenty-five versus fifteen. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> with respect to its effect in the urinary system, um, this was actually the first uh, phenomenon described in two thousand seven in Toronto um, by uh, Rob Stewart's group. And what they actually saw was that uh, a series of patients came in, nine patients who were daily ketamine users, who all presented with uh, severe dysuria, frequency, urgency, and gross hematuria. And um, these patients had sterile urine culture, CT scans that were consistent with severe infl inflammation of the bladder, uh, including a thickened bladder wall initially, small capacity bladder, and uh, perivesicular stranding. Um, and then uh, cystoscopy uh, also saw severe, what typically appeared to be ulcerative cystitis. You can see here on the left bottom, um, really the severely contracted bladder with some stranding around it. Um, <clears throat> the clinical presentation of these patients that usually comes in is that um, they typically have uh, symptoms consistent with something like interstitial cystitis or ulcerative cystitis. Um, even overactive bladder is typically um, often the complaint that they'll go to see to seek treatment, and um, these the time to onset of these uh, lower urinary tract symptoms can be anywhere from a few days after ketamine exposure to years, um, and I don't think we know why the delay versus some patients who get it uh, very very quickly. Without knowing about it, obviously, the common misdiagnoses are, are things like uh, interstitial cystitis or uh, bladder pain syndrome, uh, recurrent UTIs, even though they're sterile cultures, or something like prostatitis. But um, uh, a group out of uh, uh, the UK looked at just these presenting symptoms, and typically uh, pain in the lower abdomen, urgency frequency is pretty much the things that come in, these nonspecific symptoms that uh, can be missed in terms of its etiology if not uh, approached properly. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these studies actually come out of Asia, um, and this is a Taiwanese uh, series in that they looked at 11 patients with lower urinary tract symptoms and a history of ketamine abuse, mean age of 24 years. 
and they were using ketamine on a daily basis from one to four years. And you look at the cross-section in this chart of these patients, most were inhaling ketamine. Dosages range from, you know, under a gram to five grams per day. Uh, time to symptoms is all over the place. Some of them have hydronephrosis, some of them do not. And the bladder capacity, this is the thing that really got me, is the bladder capacity is in most of these patients, it's like under 150 cc's. And it's just like a thimble bladder, basically. They <clears throat> really uh, have no capacity for storage. When you cysto these people, unfortunately, there's no definitive uh, pathognomonic findings, but you do find that uh, typically they have low capacity contracted bladders and this widely diffuse erythematous mucosa um, throughout the bladder. And <clears throat> they can be, they can have prominent uh, neovascularizations with petechiae, something similar to what would appear like a CIS type picture or even like a cystitis glandularis. And that prompts a biopsy in a lot of these cases. There has been one case report where the urothelium bladder wall was so thin that um, they did actually puncture through the bladder on, uh, on biopsy. But mucosal necrosis and uh, severe alterations are um, typically uh, what people find with uh, cystoscopy of these patients. <clears throat> the biopsy itself, if you're able to take one, uh, really shows this markedly denuded urothelium. So they have really a complete loss of uh, urothelial layer and an inflammatory cell infiltrate. And <clears throat> you get, uh, with appropriate staining, you can have increasing in uh, mitotic figures as well as uh, this basically um, a fibrinous cap around the bladder entirely, uh, really preventing it from actually expanding on filling. And that usually happens underneath um, or in between uh, superficial lamina propria and the muscularic propria. propria. So <clears throat> they'll have actually um, a denuded layer and then this fibrous cap around the bladder. If you can sit these people down for urodynamics, you find that they have detrusor overactivity and reduced compliance capacity. And a group out of, uh, or this is the, the Taiwanese group, uh, a different time these group actually looked at uh, systemetric capacity and it's really quite reduced. Like all these patients are under 100 cc's. <laughs> Even though it is very difficult to actually appropriately interpret these um, uh, UDS tracings, the systemetric capacity is always quite shocking. Unfortunately, you can actually have ketamine effects on the upper tract. And the thought is that uh, because of decreased transit times, you don't get as bad of an effect on the urothelium lining the upper tracts. But um, these patients, or typically you can have patients ranging anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, or 13 to 51 percent of patients uh, with ketamine exposure having upper tract pathology associated uh, with usage. And this can either be from changes in the anatomical orientation of the bladder and uh, creation of bilateral reflux causing renal scarring, or um, you can actually have <clears throat> an, infect, an effect inside the kidney itself with um, papillary necrosis. And that's found in about 7% of ketamine abusers. And what happens is these patients will just slough their papillae, may cause obstruction, pain, hydronephrosis, and subsequent renal insufficiency. Uh, shown down here on the uh, bottom right is a, uh, a CT scan showing that uh, typical appearance of uh, necrosis, papillary necrosis. <coughs> there's, there's no granular linkage here, actually, because the bladder part of the upper part is the necrosis, and there's a bladder part of the upper part of the necrosis. Yeah. <coughs> Especially in the ureters, too. Yeah. And they... Yeah, I wonder, I, I, you don't see it in any of the biopsies, and the biopsies are typically done from the bladder. There have been cases where they're doing biopsies in the ureter, but uh, because of the thinness of the bladder wall, eventually, um, risk perforation of the ureter. So I think typically most of the biopsy specimens are from bladder, and they don't necessarily show that granulomatous change, but rather this kind of necrotic um, ulcerative change. <clears throat>
<clears throat> With respect to the uh, pathophysiology of how this chronic ketamine uh, uh, exposure is causing these changes in the bladder, we don't really quite know 100% yet. Um, <clears throat> there's no single kind of smoking gun behind it. It's usually, it's probably multifactorial, but several hypotheses based on lab data have been proposed, one of which, crucial to this, is exposure time. In a rat model where they injected ketamine intraperitoneally and did both acute and chronic um, UDS and uh, bladder pathologies, you can see in the rat model you get an acute reduced contractility and elevated compliance, kind of like this floppy bladder. And in the chronic setting, you get a low capacity and reduced compliance bladder, so the back to that contracted um, fibrotic bladder. <clears throat> in rats, again, direct effects of norketamine exposure can cause this urothelial cytotoxicity, which you saw in the previous pathology slides, and then you get also this disruption in tight junction. So, um, similar to the way, uh, to the hypothesis surrounding IC in that you get dysregulated urinary uh, potassium causing this uh, inflammation behind the, what in this case is a denuded urothelium. Gene expression studies also show an increase in apoptotic signaling proteins like P53, and uh, this is likely secondary to oxidative stress from the norketamine exposure. This is pretty interesting with respect to a functional side of how ketamine is causing these symptoms. The thought being that <clears throat> there's no change necessarily in cholinergic signaling, but rather it's a kind of a dysregulated purinergic transmission. So <clears throat> in terms of how purinergic neurons are coming down to the bladder and controlling contractility of detrusor muscle, Ketamine exposed mice see an enhancement in the receptor responsible for mediating that neurotransmission. So the P2XI is shown to be increased in staining just down there on the right <clears throat> with respect to ketamine exposure. And you don't get an increase in anticholinergic uh, neurons, suggesting that if this is kind of a uh, fine-tuning signaling of detrusor contraction through these pro, uh, purinergic neurons, you're getting a little bit of a kind of seizure-like sporadic uh, transmission causing this detrusor overactivity in these tiny bladders. <coughs> so um, <coughs> what can we say about management? Management, it's difficult. There's not a huge number of these, pop, of these uh, patients, and we know that they don't necessarily run to seek medical treatment, but most of the management is drawn from the painful bladder syndrome IC literature, and in addition to uh, what Dr. Stewart's paper showed in 2007 with a increase in COX-2 uh, expression in these bladders. Um, <clears throat> Out of the UK just two years ago, there was a large uh, prospective series following 319 patients with known uh, ketamine cystitis. And they brought them through a four-tiered approach. First thing was rehabilitation, probably the most important thing, early intervention and cessation of ketamine. And then they would go to uh, either COX-2 inhibitors or straight uh, broad-spectrum NSAIDs. They would take those patients to treatment failure, start to introduce opioid analgesics for the refractories. If that failed, they would go to intravesical installations uh, of things like sodium hyaluronate or uh, Botox in a series of cases. And if that was a failure, they would go to surgical management. With respect to the pharmacology we said earlier, the increasing expression of COX-2 um, is really the basis of giving these patients NSAIDs. And they do actually improve somewhat with, uh, from the symptom perspective with NSAIDs. Obviously, they have to have normal renal function before you're giving them long-dose NSAIDs or long-term NSAIDs. But um, <clears throat> uh, following uh, approximately 260 patients in that group that were exposed to NSAIDs over the course of the uh, tiered treatment, um, 202 found actual 
symptom improvement with continuing NSAIDs. The other options would be orally would be uh, something like pentasan polysulfate, um, which suggesting to be a, a supplementing the GAG layer over the this damaged or denuded urothelium to act as really a buffer to prevent those nerve endings from being exposed to uh, the uh, the toxic byproduct of phenamine. And then actually duloxetine, which is the um, an SNRI used for uh, depression, um, which has been shown to actually decrease uh, the amount of stress urinary incontinence in some uh, middle 2000 papers, but used in uh, patients with ketamine can actually increase um, urethral closing pressures through its uh, active, uh, activation of uh, uh, norepinephrine uh, receptors on the uh, external urethral sphincter. Um, <clears throat> This contributes to reduction in incontinence, and I think going through this, thinking about it, and I'm thinking the the typical patient that has this, that is a ketamine user, they're the raver, and there seems to be a, typically a lot of uh, diaper wearing at raves, <laughs> which is maybe that's actually a smart thing. They have these small, kind of tiny, contracted bladders, and they're always going to the bathroom, and they're always leaking. I don't know if that's a uh, response to it or a fashion choice, but. Um, <clears throat> for the refractory cases, the absolute refractory cases, um, typically they only really undergo a, a really short course of hydroextension. It's minimal durability, a really early symptomatic regre uh, regression. Um, but there are patients who are the bladder cripples that will undergo and have success with an augmentation and pterocystoplasty. <clears throat> And this is, uh, you know, these are the patients that are like less than 100 cc's. They have evidence of upper tract damage. There's nothing you can do for them. They failed all treatments. Um, Chung, in 2014, in their group, looked at a series of 14 patients with severe lower urinary tract symptoms <clears throat> and who had failed all of these conservative management or hydroextension, went on to an augment and looked at them three to six months post-op. <laughs> Bladder capacity obviously improved. Visual analog scale uh, for subjective measures of pain improved, and reflux, for what's worth, um, had improved in five out of the eight patients who had initial reflux. There is one case in the literature of a, if you can believe it, bilateral autotransplant of the pelvis to an ileal neobladder. <laughs> and uh, this is because both ureters were completely trashed and the bladder was just nothing. This patient is still alive <laughs> and uh, apparently it's not doing well, at least according to their uh, ongoing follow-up. Um, bad renal deterioration probably will go to uh, dialysis, but um, that's the extent of, this is a kind of like the full meal deal in, uh, in, uro in urology. Um, <clears throat> So what can we say for uh, basically the patient that comes in to the clinic that may, we actually may uh, find with increasing usage, we may find that we are seeing more of these patients more often. Uh, but we do have to maintain a high suspicion for ketamine cystitis in that classic young patient with this intractable lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, appropriate workup including serum creatinine, usually CT urograms, probably the best, um, the best modality of imaging for these people. Um, <clears throat> and of course, protecting upper tracts first, stents or bilateral uh, perks if needed. And then probably the most important thing is, is early intervention with a multidisciplinary team to get these people you know, off of ketamine as they've had this really de deleterious effect on, uh, on their bladders right off the bat. And this really should proceed through a multidisciplinary team. Uh, I think for the last last five minutes or so, I just want to do uh, a quick little. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is that in patients that are chronic heavy users? Maybe you see them as tumors in the early childhood system. And then, you know, since we are, Brian and Kirk have been on asking for surgery, and I think he actually blew up the call. That's a good one. Yeah. Is that if we've got 
Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm worried about IC just being like a grab bag, you know, a catch-all of things that we just can't diagnose in the clinic. Um, I mean, not typically, not the Campbell's definition of IC, but the, you know, we have to be cautious about where, you know, how we label these patients, and then follow-up is a huge issue. And I think if, you know, if upper tracts are threatened. Um, that's, you know, that's the step before life is threatened and these patients are all young and oftentimes I think maybe, you know, if they're, if they do have stricturing, you know, bilateral ureteric stents might not be the best thing for them because if they're at risk of falling through the cracks or follow up, then sometimes it's best to have a tube out of the back. <laughs> they're so severely crippled. Are they? You know, really? I have three. They're there, hey? Yeah. That was the sense I got from um, from just going through this literature and you hear these uh, and you, you read these stories of the accounts with these patients and you're just like they're total bladder bladder cripples. Like they can't do anything. Back and forth to the bathroom. Yeah. Does the reverse of that mean that it's reversible if they stop Nah. Unfortunately not. I think the um, it depend, I think it depends on the stage. The lower urinary tract symptomatology is really going to follow the pathology. So the path is established first, the fibrous you know, encapsulation of the bladder, and then all of a sudden they're, you know, they come to clinic. And I think once you're there, you know, you're, going a, you're going a different way with it. I don't know if it's reversible. If you, if you divert, uh, is it the risk? That's another interesting... Uh, there's, so there's, in some of the augmentations, uh, I think four, four out of the 14 patients that the Chung group augmented continued to use and had reuptake in the bowel, from the bowel. And they were, <clears throat> so you get, I don't think they, there was no biopsies or anything of the bowel after, but they were continued users and... They thought they'd actually, they were recycling some of the norketamine through their bowel as it was being taken up back into the bloodstream. So, you know, extended highs and uh, it's constant toxic recycling. And, and I've seen all, this has a picture of all the chronic inflammation is associated with uh, carcinogenesis. So is there an association yeah. of risk with cancer or is it just the <coughs> bladder? I think that the, so there's no evidence, there's nothing in the literature associated with um, ketamine induced like CIS or a, uh, a bladder cancer or anything, but, and all of the biopsy stuff is just chronic inflammatory change, but, um, so there's nothing, there's no documented uh, bladder cancers from that. <laughs> Lots of water, Dr. So, flush everything out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, yeah. I think, um, yeah, layering uh, the, the, the symptoms associated with ketamine exposure on a one-time usage. I mean, there's been documented reports of people using it one time. It's like, oh, bladder. But... You know, all these patients that have these chronic fibrotic changes, they're all heavy dose daily users, you know, up to five grams a day. So it's, um, and the exposure is is a crucial component of it. So, yeah, do you want to jump all over one guy doing it over the weekend? I mean, maybe from an intervention perspective, but... Right. Like that? Yeah. But yeah. This is seen more frequently in recreational <clears throat> exposure as opposed to yeah. this 
think so. I mean, um, Absolutely, right? absolutely. And, and you don't really, there's not big case series of, yeah. There's nothing from the, the yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, in my discussions with, uh, uh, I have a friend that's in the American military, and he, um, <clears throat> you know, they, all the, the 18 Delta medics, he's all a special forces medic, they all carry it. Yeah. And they all will use it if, you know, limbs are lost in the field or whatever. They're using right. it as a uh, acute anesthetic. Right. Um, but then when those patients are transferred to Germany or whatever, they're, you know, under the rehabilitation okay. doctors and, and other surgeons up there. So, uh, so they get like an acute dose. Yeah. Into, okay. Yeah, in the field. And, yeah. 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 They don't. But they don't go on long term. have reports through the system of long term. Yeah. Yeah. And that may say something about, I mean, the, the psychological state of the patient or the person, the individual who uses it as a recurring theme in a chronically exposed kind of risk factor area. I mean, that's that's probably a different person than you know, somebody who's on the battlefield, I guess. They're on a different battlefield. So, other questions? Or so reminiscent of the occasional patient who seems to have a bone marrow transplant? I didn't see anything in the papers. Yeah. I didn't see anything. That's a very similar to the post medicine. Yeah, what it looks like in the. Uh, yeah. Patient Alex recently was exactly like, what do you mean that's just. Yeah. <laughs> he knows he has bladder cancer and he's hitting the. Uh, <laughs> uh, quickly, I know. I mean, it's a huge issue. Like, it's uh, this is just some background stuff. I think we all know this. This fentanyl citrate is the stuff that we use, or the anesthesiologists use. It's super potent, 100 times more potent than morphine, 50 times more potent than heroin. Um, <clears throat> mu opioid uh, receptor antagonist. Or agony. The illicit stuff is coming through China, unfortunately. Um, it's really unregulated in China. Actually, they have no uh, they have no system to track even legitimate production of fentanyl in China. And the illicit stuff is being manufactured in the same facility in some cases, and it's coming out the back door, and it's being transferred to North America in these urine test strips in the silica packs. And uh, apparently I found out that uh, border agents can't uh, legally open anything less than 30 grams uh, without consent of the recipient. So that's interesting. Um, LD50 for fentanyl is 30 micrograms per kilogram. 100 kilograms. This is in monkeys, not with data in humans. 100 kilogram human. Um, 300 micrograms, I think. So that's like, you know, one salt tablet, basically. Um, and of course, we're getting increasing, we're getting reports of increasing illicit domestic uh, production. A shocking thing I found is uh, uh, we're the second highest per capita consumers of opioids in the world. I always thought uh, we'd be way down the list, but apparently we're number two. Um, and <clears throat> we're Giving all these people opioids as physicians, 19.1 million opioid um, prescriptions this year, or in 2015. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, this is up almost half a million over one year, just from 2014 to 2015. Fentanyl usage illicitly and um, legitimately is increasing as... Uh, Outpatients as well. Unfortunately, no data, no national database in Canada, but we take some cues from the states and see that uh, you know age-related uh, rates of death associated prescription opioids and heroin have been increasing over the course of the last decade and a half. This, the red line is heroin, 
which is weird. It was stable for almost a decade, and all of a sudden, fentanyl's on the scene, and it pops up because fentanyl's being added to heroin. And they don't tell the user. But all these deaths, I think, are bad business for the drug dealers. BC and Alberta seem to be the most impacted in Canada. In El uh, BC alone, in 2012, fentanyl deaths, or uh, opioid-related deaths, were 42. In 2015, 418. Um, in two years, almost 400 in Alberta. Alberta is the worst right now. <coughs> uh, we keep getting exposed to these uh, headlines, you know, up to nine drug overdoses in uh, Vancouver in early December of this year. BC alone this year, in, uh, in 2016, 914 deaths. You know, it's surpassed motor vehicle collisions as the leading uh, cause of unnatural deaths and now declared, the fentanyl crisis is really declared as the uh, state of emergency in, um, in BC. Uh, silver lining, I mean, transplants have gone up. Where's Jen Locke? <laughs> Jen knows all about that. And the guys at St. Paul's. <laughs> um, you know, Dr. Landberg, uh, he was recently interviewed um, by a couple of different papers, and just over the course of, you know, a month and a half in this year, from January to February, there's 37 transplants to St. Paul's. A third were estimated to be related to opioid overdoses, which is like three times as many as last year. Um, it's expanding the pool for sure uh, of ECD, uh, EC, ECD kidneys. And this is mirrored, you know, in the data that they have coming out of the states right now. It's about the same, a little bit less actually, surprisingly. But this is all New England uh, states um, showing a drastic increase in the number of ECD owners from drug overdose in 2016 compared to 2012. So, um, but that's, I guess, the silver lining. That's uh, pretty much it. We don't really have any other. Uh, data yet, but I'm interested to see the long-term numbers of this year compared to uh, last year in terms of when um, and when all of the data is compiled through uh, BC Transplant. So things to keep in mind just for conclusions. Rising ketamine use, got to pay attention to it in clinic, uh, maybe, and um, has to be, the treatment has to go through a multidisciplinary team. I think that's the uh, most important thing. We may be the first people to see these patients, but to get everybody involved, I think it's, uh, it's crucial to their care long term. Um, and then the fentanyl stuff, I mean, that's, it's pretty shocking to see the numbers, but um, you know, there is that silver lining uh, to our transplant population. And um, from what I can tell from the literature, there's no effect of fentanyl on kidneys long term that go into transplant patient, but it hasn't been um, really addressed actually through. Presumably it is all washed out with our response to surgery. Does anybody have a question? Any other questions? Is there a fact that there are rising problems of ECD donors in this country? Short term impact, yeah. The, the Typically, the, EC, the extended criteria DCD donors are typically lower functioning graphs acutely. <clears throat> so that pool is increasing. It's a different population for the kidneys. Yeah. Healthy yeah, these are young, healthy good, people. Uh, good organs. But so they, I don't think the outcomes on the DCD are Yeah. Like the error bars on <clears throat> the acute creatinines uh, will be wider. Could the uh, uh, releasing of uh, marijuana and uh, ketamine are common combination drug. Uh, I don't know of the doses of ketamine that those patients would, or those individuals would get with the amount of cannabis. Just used purposefully together? Yeah. Yeah. No. I don't think within that population, the, uh, the contamination with the phetamine, or sorry, with the um, fentanyl and... Um, heroin was actually purposeful 
And I think it's because you have in any population, you have that subgroup that's going to be needing more and more of the drug using the community. Um, and fentanyl was what they alleged to be the answer to that increasing high needed. Yeah. 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 And if anybody has any, just raise your lab and work with that. You're having frequency here. We'll flick the lights on and off really fast. Good. Any other questions? I think that's good.